PBS, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's also, uh, you know, done, uh, you know, several uh, foundational works and logic and programming uh, as well as practical applications, both on the actually applied system development side and developing the theory for it. Uh, he's a co-recipient of the 2012 CAB Award for Fundamental Contributions to computer aided Verification. And last year, he received the very prestigious Brand Award for fundamental contributions to the world of production. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Shankar to what you talk. Thanks, Supratik. It's, it's a great pleasure to you know, come here and catch up with old friends. So uh, it's uh, truly a very, very uh, pleasant experience for me to be here in, in this very familiar uh, country to me as well as uh, be among friends. Now, the uh, uh, talk of this kind, actually, uh, composing higher share in software, is, is not something I would typically give because it, it's kind of uh, coming at a 30,000 uh, foot level. Um, but, and, and I am just a programmer, I don't really have I, you know, a, a high level view of uh, software engineering or software development or any of these things. But some of the points I'll be making here are, are points I was hoping other people would make somewhere along the way. I waited, 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 and then nobody made these points. So, uh, you know, I just kind of lost my patience. So I will be saying things that I hope are provocative, I hope are controversial, I hope those of you in the room as well as uh, online will uh, be provoked, that you, that you will ask uh, questions and so on. As you can notice, the you know software is is, is a problem. The uh, uh, you know as a as a programmer, the devil sits on your shoulder and tells you, you know, that looks kind of uh, challenging. Why don't you just cut a corner here? Why don't you just cut a corner there? Nobody will notice. After all, you know, you want to get it working. You want to demo it. You want to see it doing something. So you know, let it go and. As a programmer, you have to tell the devil, no, I won't do that. I have to get it right. You know, this is something where, uh, as a programmer, I'm anticipating all possible ways in which this could go wrong. And, make, and, and I'm trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. As a user, you might not notice. I hit a bug. I mean, we've seen this now, just now, with, with uh, setting up. A bug that I notice perhaps every 30 seconds. And if I paid more attention, I probably notice uh, th there must be a bug that I hit every five seconds. Okay. And a lot of these are annoying, but some of them are painful, like you can't you know, use the projector. Um, and uh, My colleague uh, Richard Waldinger actually has this thing where he says, all research in computer science should stop until we fix the problem, projection problem. You know, until we can get projection done smoothly, you know, no other research in computer science is, it deserves to exist. But the, um, I, and if you, if you don't think that there are, you know, bugs happening every 30 seconds, you should count yourself as oblivious, okay? You're not paying attention. That's, that's, that's you know, a, a, a problem for all of us. We, we don't complain enough. 
and we tolerate uh, something that's uh, inadequate. Now, this is a challenging problem. I mean, software is one of the hardest things that we deal with. And uh, the, you know, the, the uh, fact that we've come this far is actually a truly uh, impressive uh, achievement. I, I regard the modern software stack as mankind's, one of mankind's greatest en engineering achievements. I think this is a, a stack of abstractions that we've built. That, uh, uh, can, you, can you mute whoever's out there? Okay, so uh, you know, is is truly uh, impressive the fact that we can even get this far. I mean, forget the projection problems that we can have uh, an online presentation that we can click on things and uh, magically, uh, you know, videos play for you, emails get sent, and when these things happen, there's actually a you know hundreds of layers of abstractions that are are being uh, bridged in order to uh, get these functionalities to your fingertips, to your eyeballs. So this is truly a, a, a great accomplishment. But this you know, has come with a price. Not only is, you know, are we dealing with a lot of inferior, defective software, but we're dealing with a vast attack surface. We're dealing with nation states that have infinite resources, infinite patience, to sit there and probe the software and uh, attack it for vulnerabilities. And the cost of this, the cost of bugs, the cost of insecurities, uh, the, the, the uh, annoyance that uh, we have to go through in order to do this is immense. You may not be noticing it, but you are paying the price constantly. So the engineering costs alone run into $2.1 trillion a year. And I mean, I regard all these numbers as uh, understatements. I think the cost is actually higher. And remember, this is trillion with a T. That that cost is is nearly the GDP of India. Okay, that's the price you're you're paying for it. And uh, the the cyber crime is again something that you you all have to be nervous about. You have to be nervous about your identity being stolen, your passwords being stolen, your bank account being drained. And it does happen to the tune of $6 trillion a year worldwide. Okay, That's cyber crime alone. And this means that we really have to get a grip on getting software right before it even gets deployed. Uh, you know, this is really important that, uh, you know, uh, these, these, uh, things that we use actually are deployed with a certain uh, assurance that comes ahead of their deployment. And we as users actually can see that assurance as well. And in, in many cases, you, know, you take a plane or you, you know, take an elevator and so on. You know that you know, there, there's a certificate out there that says this has been certified to be safe. You know that the FAA has gone through the aircraft and made sure that, made sure that the aircraft itself is safe. So you know, we need something similar uh, for software. Now, software is, is uh, hard. It's really strange. The reason it's, it's so difficult to get right is that it's, you know, it does so many things for us in so many different contexts. And you know, we are not masters of these things. You need to not only understand the application, you need to understand the software ecosystem, you need to deal with multiple platforms. This is a truly a difficult pro problem and you have to deliver a whole bunch of guarantees of uh, you know, things like timeliness and uh, you know, all of these things. I'll, I'll come to that a bit. And uh, so this is kind of a, a difficult problem and just a tiny error in, in software can expose a huge vulnerability. A, a, a very, very small missing semicolon can have consequences. Missing white space has had consequences and so on. So, so this is really a, a, a difficult thing. We don't have a discipline of you know, how to build software. We just don't. And, and this is not because we are dumb or stupid or anything like that. It's because it's a hard problem. Software is about so many different things and there's not really one discipline that covers it. And so whatever there exists right now is not at all helpful. I mean, that because it, it, you know, anything you can say at the generic level is almost worthless. Okay, so you, you, you do need to have 
disciplines that actually uh, target specific domains that tell you how to build software for that particular domain because what may be uh, sensible for computer algebra might not make sense for uh, real time systems and so on so so that's that's one of the uh, issues out there and the the uh, other issue with this is that you know, we tend to deploy software, we tend to kind of look at it and uh, we, we, you know, fix it and so on. The, the uh, idea is that you know, we can always patch it, we can uh, uh, you know, do uh, something else that layers uh, a defense mechanism. And what you do when, you're, when you patch things and apply band-aids that way is you make it easier and easier and easier for the attacker. You, you're creating a one-stop shop for the attackers when you, when you do you know, band-aids like that. That's not the way to go about it. You got to design it right the first time. Make sure that all of these properties are there, ground up. And I'll talk about you know the way in which you need to be able to actually capture the assurance of these software components in a way that is convincing and uh, watertight. So I mentioned a few celebrity bugs that uh, you've probably uh, uh, heard of some of them, and uh, I'll uh, say a little bit more. But uh, th these are just things you've heard of. But the, the, and these are some of them are very expensive. The Intel FDiv bug cost Intel a half a billion dollars. The uh, uh, Ariane 5 uh, pro uh, bug, for instance, cost uh, uh, you know the European Space Agency uh, another half a billion dollars. So a lot of these have been you know quite expensive, both in life and property, and uh, in 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 money. So software, you know, can uh, go wrong in 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 uh, you know in, in uh, lots of ways. So the uh, uh, typical properties that you want on, so on software is not only that it have functionality, but also you know that it be performant, that it be reliable, robust. So you can give it any input you want. You can run it in different contexts. It should still work. It should be resilient. If something goes down, if if a component fails, you should still be able to. Uh, Continue operation. You should give the you know best performance possible. You should recover from failures. It should be persistent in terms of uh, saving things uh, for future use. It should be secure. It should be maintainable, usable. You know, there's a whole long list of things, and you know the poor programmer has to worry about all of these uh, illities that that are that are there. And for safety alone, you know, you need to be able to mitigate all possible hazards. You've got to think about all the possible things that can happen in the world. It can, cra you know, it can physically be attacked. It can f burn. There can be floods. You know, there, there's all kinds of things that software itself could cause in the in the real world. So you got to, you know, worry about this. And I mentioned there societal collapse. So lots of things that we're using are actually causing societal collapse. And uh, this is something, again, you know, what can a poor programmer do about this? The fact that their lines of code are actually leading to this. So in particular, the, the uh, idea of, of this then is that you got to somehow build the software in such a way that you can convince somebody that there, there is no kind of uh, failure that, that happens, which is a deviation from intended behavior. And this, these could be caused by design errors, programming errors, and so on. So in, in the end, you, you could have a whole bunch of reasons why things happen not just due to bad lines of code things can happen because you know regulation is missing the, there there are certain things that the software should have done in in order to be uh, safe that uh, regulation could have uh, ensured and that didn't happen inept management is a, is a very very common use i use the word inept management it's actually redundant you know, all management is inept but the uh, uh, this is often a, a huge problem with software projects, as they fail because we don't really have a science of how to manage software projects. Bad design, defective engineering, inadequate maintenance, and then improper operation itself could be an issue. And here, this graph actually shows you that the cost of fixing something during maintenance is 100 times the cost of fixing it during design. So it really helps to invest a lot of effort to have trained manpower, even if it's expensive, to, to do that at the design stage so that you save that 100x cost out there. Any questions so far? Any questions from online? No. OK. OK, so here I've, I've tabulated some of the, uh, the risks that uh, you know, software uh, poses. 
uh, and uh, th these can stem from a number of uh, channels. So you know you can have uh, ha hardware bugs like Intel FDIV, Spectre, and Meltdown due to speculative execution. Then you could have uh, side channel attacks, uh, things like uh, row hammer and uh, you know power analysis. You can have calculation errors, things uh, you know for example, uh, confusing uh, met the imperial uh, system with metric system. So these are things that that uh, happen as uh, calculation errors. Ariane five was actually a, an overflow that uh, actually was of no consequence, but it ended up crashing because they figured there's not going to be any software errors. So if anything went wrong, it must be a hardware error incorrectly. Again, th this is a very common thing where your assumptions are not valid and you've never actually exposed them to any scrutiny. You've never actually collected evidence that your assumptions are indeed valid. And I'll come to that uh, later as well. So you could have uh, uh, memory errors and type errors. This is, again, very common. Programmers have to deal with these all the time, buffer overflows, null dereferences, uncaught exceptions. All of these are uh, things that we have to deal with in the you know, programming world. So uh, you know, failures in crypto is a, is a common thing. There was a, a period in, I mean, the open SSL is a frequent whipping boy, but almost all the crypto libraries there are buggy in, in, in significant ways. The, uh, you know, the, some, someone responded to a Valgrind complaint. They were using uninitialized variables as a source of random noise in open SSL. And Valgrind said, you know, see, there's an uninitialized variable, so someone initialized it. So for a month out there, everyone had the same key. And uh, this, this went unnoticed for a, for a whole month before someone realized this was... A, and again, you, know, you don't know what to blame out there. You know, was it the, you know, really unprincipled use of an uninitialized variable as a source of random noise? Was it, you know, somebody coming there responding to Valgrind with good intentions and uh, initializing that variable? So who, who knows what's to blame? So lack of input validation is a very, very frequent source of uh, attacks. So it's, it's very easy to attack things where they, they uh, um, parsers themselves that are supposed to protect the input coming in uh, have bugs in them and, and uh, allow, for example, anyone to claim that they're google.com just because google.com some appeared somewhere within their URL. And uh, that, that actually uh, has happened. Um, so uh, race conditions, so Terac 25 was, you know, it killed a number of patients. So the North American blackout, at and crash, all of these are you know, really celebrated things. And you could actually have a good career studying these bugs. The, the, you know, uh, I highlight uh, my colleague, Peter Neumann, who's been warning about this. Peter Neumann, by the way, is the designer of the Unix file system. If you do Chmod, you're you know, uh, honoring uh, Peter Neumann. So um, the, he uh, is a very significant figure in computer security, and he's been warning about this for decades. He's been warn uh, uh, insisting that security should be built ground up. We shouldn't be patching stuff. And people did not pay attention to him. You know, even I didn't pay enough at, uh, attention to him. Now I look back and think the man was really, you know, he, he is really prescient. By the way, he's nearly 90 years old and extremely active. He's cutting edge. He's uh, doing a lot of work uh, even today. So, uh, you know, for me, this is an inspiration. I hope to be like him one day. So, uh, Peter, Peter is a you know, great colleague. So, a, a few other things like that. And in the end, the social engineering, which is very, very hard for us to protect against. So, this is the thing. We found the enemy. The enemy is us. If you know this famous Pogo cart cartoon from, I think it's the uh, Earth Day from 1970. So the, you know, there's pollution all around the forest, and uh, so the uh, yeps on. We met the enemy, and he is us. You know, we are the problem here. We uh, we are the ones that are responsible for making sure the software is uh, safe, resilient, uh, secure, and so on. And we don't seem to be doing that good a job. With software, another weird thing is that unlike other engineering artifacts, physically engineered artifacts we can get software 100% correct. Okay, in principle, we can get it uh, absolutely correct. We can get every behavior to be conformant. <laughs> exactly. Modulo, you know, the challenge of getting accurate specifications, which is 
an extremely tough challenge. This is again where a lot of software projects fail. We can't even identify what the software is, you know, what the intended behavior of the software should be. This is really hard to do. The physical world is messy also. You know, you make assumptions about the physical world. That's also uh, a challenging thing because the physical world may not behave in the way the software thinks it, it does. And that, that's also something that is a, is a difficult challenge. The, the physical platforms that you run on also, you know, you make assumptions about those. And who knows, like Rohammer is something where, you know, you, you hit a memory address repeatedly and that starts to kind of, you know, uh, uh, create failures and those failures start leak, leaking information. I could not have anticipated that. Even something like speculative execution, we've all studied speculative execution. Who thought of this, you know, specter and uh, heart bleed things that, you know, it, it took a long time from, I mean, uh, 40 years or something from speculative execution being introduced to these uh, bugs being found in all of the processes that used it. Okay, this was amazing that, uh, you know, we, we could not anticipate these kinds of things. But, you know, I would claim that even if perfection is only partially attainable, it's worth doing because when you do this, you narrow down the kinds of things you need to worry about. Okay, you don't have to worry about, you know, diagnosing some complicated thing where it's some combination of software bugs together with hardware failures, together with bad specifications, together with, and, and so on. So you're kind of collecting all the dirt and putting it in one corner of the room. And if you need to look for something, you can just look in there. Okay, that's, that's the advantage of even getting partial uh, perfection out there. And we can do this. This is, you know, there's some uh, significant projects that people have done. Uh, the C uh, uh, com computational logic, the, this was the group that I did my PhD thesis with. They have a verified stack of a hardware processor, uh, uh, an assembler, uh, uh, prog a high level programming language, an operating system kernel um, that, that they did. Um, there's Spark Ada. They've been doing a num number of commercial projects with a verifiable version of Ada. They've had a lot of success with it. The NASA Langley folks have used PVS, the tool that uh, I've been developing, to uh, do a number of air traffic control algorithms. These are complex algorithms that involve what's happening with planes in the physical world as well as software control. The uh, uh, pretty reasonable C compiler has been verified. The Intel i7 processor has been subject to a lot of uh, hardware equivalence checking. The cell for microkernel, the uh, Airbus uh, so avionics software have been subject to static analysis. This is a really impressive project. The Cake Camel project has taken a, a significant subset of ML, the uh, 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 high level programming language, and created a, a full runtime that is verified. They've even verified it down to hardware if you want. And then people are developing libraries like uh, you know, Everest is doing uh, HTTPS and uh, uh, TLS. Uh, uh, that's another uh, very significant project. So th these are significant milestones. Now you might think, okay, you know, I come from the formal methods world that the recommendation I should make is, is formal methods. Uh, that's not my point. You can verify good designs, you can verify bad designs. That, that doesn't mean much. Okay, so the, the important thing here is that, and, and those bad designs build up technical debt. They are hard to verify, they uh, are hard to use as, uh, in, as components and so on. So really what we need is, is uh, a number of things that we need to take care of. So one is that, uh, you know, we need to create an ecosystem that itself is well designed and predictable and free of these things that I call original sins things where, for example, we've conflated the call stack and variable stack. And that means we cannot protect, I mean, somebody can actually do a, a buffer overflow and then change the, the return address and th thereby affect the control flow of the program. That's a trillion dollar bug that should never have been there, yet it's persisted all of this, uh, you know, 60, uh, I guess six or seven decades that, uh, you know, computing has been in existence. So this is Again, something that should have been banished a long time ago. So, uh, you know, things, uh, other forms of stack abuse, broken abstractions, uh, weakened protections, all of these things are just original sins that we are living with. And they, these should, should be just cleansed from the system. The main thing here is that, you know, we need to actually think in terms of software design, not as design of how the software works, but 
an explanation for why it works. How can you convince somebody that the software works? This is true in other engineering disciplines. The, you know, o Otis did not invent the elevator. He invented the safety mechanism, and he invented a safety mechanism that was so obviously safe that people were willing to ride in elevators. So that's the enabling technology. So a lot of these things, uh, safety is what makes things possible. And the lack of safety you know, imposes an opportunity cost. There are systems you don't build because we have no way of making sure that they're safe. And we won't use them for that reason. And now, you know, because software is being used in uh, robotic surgery, telesurgery, uh, medical devices, transportation grids, transportation networks, power grids, uh, uh, self-driving cars, all of these things. These are things that can potentially lead to loss of life. So you need to be able to give a design that is um, correct by assurance. So design for assurance must be the case. And in particular, the, the assurance that you create, the argument that you create for it should be efficient. It shouldn't be some convoluted argument that says, well, you know, run a, a trillion test cases or you know, do some complicated analysis to make sure that you know, there are no runtime errors, that it's, it's timely, it's uh, resilient, and so on. It should be something where it's safe, because if it weren't, the flaws would be obvious. The flaws would be obvious to a, uh, to a skeptic. Okay, that's what you want to do with these designs, even if that comes at a cost. Okay, you want to prioritize efficiency of the argument, even if that comes at a cost. For, so, for example, using a, 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 a kind of operating system separation kernel, uh, being able to use a strongly typed language, all of these are forms of uh, efficiency that you get because if there was, a, there was a flaw in your type system, that's a big flaw. You've opened up the falsification space because it's not about this particular program having a type error, it's about your whole type system being wrong. And that's something that you can uh, easily falsify. You should focus on architectures. That's really important. You know, the, the architecture I, I view as the model of computation and interaction. So if you identify what are the components, how they need to interact, and how they need to scale, then you've solved more or less half the design problem. The rest then is just kind of making sure that the components actually implement their interfaces and implement their functions correctly, and that's a lot easier. I'll show you an example of this later. And in the end, you need to capture all this in a workflow that's evidence recording. So you need to be able to record the evidence as you're designing the software through a, a workflow that captures it. And the associated claims and evidence, that's the value proposition. That's the thing that you're buying. You're not buying the software. You're buying why the software works. Any questions? So, uh, how much time do I have left? Mm. 20 minutes left? Okay. Okay. So, uh, to me, uh, you know, you got to, uh, you know, a lot of these words are vague assurance, design, and so on. You know, I haven't pinned down any of these things, but I'll, I'll try and be more precise about this. So, uh, to me, a design is, is kind of a, a blueprint. So, it's, it's something that, uh, um, you know, you, you start to kind of uh, sketch out before you even start building the uh, actual product. And in particular, it consists of these three parts. That is, you, you have a kind of uh, part, uh, you know, something that's fixed, which is the semantics and structure, and something that's allowed to vary, which is the dynamics. So the semantics basically specifies how uh, individual components are acting, how they interact, and so on. That's the semantics. The structure. So the, the semantics is something that's generic. It's not for your specific design. Your, your, your semantics is something that just comes with, for example, your programming language or the model of computation you're using. So that's, it's not de design specific. The structure is design specific. It tells you which components you have and how they fit into this particular architecture. So that's structure. So without these two things, you have no semantics at all. You don't I mean, you know, anything can do anything, anything can interact any which way. So, you know, having what is fixed is really important because if you allow everything to vary, then there's no meaning at all. Okay. So it's really important to have something that's fixed. And then you have the dynamics, which is the time varying aspect of things. How, how 
things behave, you know, given the structure, how the computation itself evolves in time. So that's the, uh, the, the kind of uh, what I mean by design. And in particular, when you design for assurance, you identify these, these pieces and you know, build an assurance case based on the semantics. Now, any assurance kind of argument will not do. Uh, I'll be talking about, as I said, an efficient argument. And the motivation for efficient argument comes from this uh, particular accident that happened with a plane called the RAF Nimrod XV-230 which uh, had an accident in uh, 2006 that killed all 14 people on board. What had happened is in the, uh, this plane has been flying since the 60s. So it's you know, developed in, uh, you know, in the 60s. And in the 90s, they added air-to-air -air refueling. And nine, you know, just 90 seconds following an air-to-air -air refueling, the plane caught fire and, and was, uh, you know, uh, it killed everybody on board. And this had gone through a certification process. It had just gone through a really flawed certification process. Because the argument they gave is that this is a reliable plane. It's been flying for a long time. And we're adding mid-air refueling to an already reliable plane. Hence, it must be reliable. That's exactly, you know, the wrong argument. You know, everything about it is wrong because you can't verify any of these claims. Sometimes the fact that it's been flying for a long time is the source of the problem because many components have been, have, have worn out. And this is indeed what happened here, which is that there was a heat sink right near where the air to air refueling was. After you refuel, there's fuel sloshing around and there's this really hot object. The insulation around it was inadequate. Actually, I think the insulation also kind of uh, absorbed the fuel. And this thing was a, an accident that was guaranteed to happen. Okay. So if you know Chuck Perro and things like that, these are called normal accidents. These are things that you know, just happen because we, we are unable to think about all the ways in which things go wrong. We, we, we have this optimistic view of the world, and this is kind of a normal accident. Um, so again, the, the Haddon Cave Report is, is a great document on this because it analyzes this thing and uh, tells you, it names names, tells you what went wrong, what should have been done, and so on. So I highly recommend the Haddon Cave Report as a, a great source of insights on, on what I'm going to talk about. So in particular, this says that the cross-feed duct was placed dangerously close to a fuel tank. As a matter of good engineering practice, it would be extremely unusual to put it no higher, to co-locate an exposed source of ignition with a potential source of fuel, unless it was designed, designated a fire zone, and provided with commensurate, commensurate protection. That means you should have some, a fire extinguisher or something there if you think this is a dangerous zone. Nevertheless, this is what occurred with the Nimrod. Okay. So this means that the assurance argument should not have been on the basis of this has been flying for a long time. It should have been that fuel and ignition cannot interact anywhere outside of the combustion chamber. Okay, and that's a protected zone. That's okay. You know, you need that to fly the plane. Anywhere else, fuel and ignition are separate, and and that that argument was never made. And it's the same kind of thing you need to do with software. You need to make these efficient arguments. So unfortunately, the Nimrod safety case was a lamentable job from start to finish. It was riddled with errors, it missed key dangers. Its production is a story of incompetence, complacency, and cynicism. The safety case was fatally undermined by a general malaise, a widespread assumption by those involved that the Nimrod was safe anyway because it had successfully flown for 30 years. And the task of drawing up the safety case became essentially a paperwork and tick box exercise. This is very common even you know, among software. They just say, yeah, did that, did that, did that, did that. But another problem in software is that you don't know who is supposed to tell you this was done. A lot of issues in, in software don't come up when you're writing individual lines of code. You don't know whether this line of code is secure or not. Th these have to be done at a higher level in the design, and that's what is missing. So often the managers just tell the programmer, make sure that all this is done. And the programmer looks at his line of code and says, nothing in my line of code tells me you know, what to do out here because it's, it's, it's at a larger level, it's at a, a level that isn't even visible, uh, in, you know, for the line of code. It's the context in which things are used, even sometimes the physical context. So, you know, that's the really important thing. And, and in this case, it is the physical context. A safety case 
itself is defined as a structured argument supported by a body of evidence that provides a compelling, comprehensible, and valid case that a system is safe for a given application in a given environment. The basic aims, purpose, and underlying philosophy of safety cases were clearly defined, but there was a lim limited practical gui guidance as to how, in fact, to go about constructing a safety case. If the Nimrod safety case had been properly carried out, the loss of the XV-230 would have been avoided. Okay. And that's a costly thing, both in terms of life and property. So, what is now a, a kind of safety case and what, how do we create, curate, uh, and maintain assurance? So uh, a typical thing would be that a safe, uh, an assurance argument consists of claims. You want to say this software is safe, for instance. And typically you want to say it's safe with respect to some hazards that you've enumerated that, you know, if, for example, if it's flying a plane, it won't crash the plane, the plane won't catch fire, and so on. And then you know you you uh, decompose those claims into subclaims. Some of those subclaims are now about artifacts, like, for example, the physical artifacts, the interfaces, the uh, uh, the actual uh, code, the software architecture, and so on. And then others are about assumptions. They're about assumptions that you make, for example, about the physical plant, about sensors, actuators, and so on. So typically, the requirements decompose into models that you have about the operator and the environment and then you know assumptions you have about the plant and then properties that you've uh, established about the control software and that in turn decomposes into properties that you can claim about the architecture and the uh, components that are running on the architecture and, and the platform assumptions themselves. The architecture itself decomposes into a logical architecture and a physical architecture. The platform has to match the physical architecture. So th this is the kind of systematic way in, the, in, in which you can actually ensure that the software itself is operating in a context uh, that guarantees that the requirements hold. So, uh, as I said, the, these things have to be uh, efficient arguments, and in particular, you know, you have to provide a well-structured argument that, for example, the assumptions that you have are, are reasonable assumptions that they won't fail. That you have evidence that they won't fail. So, if you if you have the plant model, for instance, you have to provide evidence that you've captured the plant model uh, appropriately. If you have uh, f uh, sensors or any other thing, you need to have fault models as well. You need to know the fault models, for example, how the uh, computing platform itself can fail, how the communication channels might fail, how the sensors might fail, all of these need to be taken into account in a, in a, in a good and efficient uh, assurance argument. Whereas with inefficient arguments, you have claims like, you know, it's been flying for a long time, things that are hard to falsify. What does that have to do with the safety of the plane? It's hard to see. So you have imprecise claims like this, you know, software has uh, gone through some ISO certification, whatever that means. Okay. So, you know, things like this are imprecise claims, unfalsifiable assumptions, uh, complex technical arguments, you know, flawed or irrelevant evidence, invalid chains of reasoning, and improper tracking of chain. And part of what goes wrong is the thing that you assured is not the thing that is actually flying in the plane. And so there are gaps between you know the assurance case and the actual physical the, the actual real artifact so you know an efficient argument should not have something like and then a miracle occurs where you know the other professor is telling him i think you should be more explicit here in in step 2 and so efficient arguments should use precise claims validatable models reusable tools architectural separation of concerns, rigorous chains of reasoning. And models play, you know, the, the kind of pillars of efficient arguments are models, architectures, languages, and tools. And models play a hugely important role because when you design, you can't design for all of the things that happen in the world. You can only design for a certain model of things. And a part of it is actually making sure the world behaves according to your model, but the other flip side of it is making sure the models themselves are realistic. So as it says out here, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's what you're trying to do with these models out here, with plant models, fault models, and so on. And in particular, you need to be resilient as well. If something is outside the model, you still need to have a best effort. So if, if something isn't really anticipated in your fault model and it goes wrong, you still need to know that you know, the system can do its best effort. It doesn't, doesn't just collapse because of this. So I'll skip all this. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a few things that we're doing along these lines and uh, uh, as, as instances of the ways in which we're doing design for assurance. So one is this Radler architecture. And it's a very, very simple uh, model of computation and interaction. It's a, 
published subscribe architecture, distributed system in which you have publishers, nodes, and subscriber nodes. So they, uh, you have topics on which some nodes publish and others subscribe to them and so on, and, and that's the uh, idea. And in Radler, it, it's just got two assumptions about these things, that the nodes execute periodically, quasi-periodically, within a min and max period, because you can't be you know, absolutely sure, and that they communicate through, you know, from publisher to subscriber on bounded latency channels. So when you make these two assumptions, the, f the physical architecture you, you want to ensure you know, delivers these assumptions. There is a, a scheduler schedules the nodes, and the uh, communication infrastructure actually makes sure those latencies hold. So you decompose that problem into something that you can do generically. And then you have to make sure that the nodes themselves you know, have certain contracts associated with them. They're just step functions. So the, the step functions have contracts. So this architecture has a number of properties. One is that it decomposes temporal behavior into pre-post conditions for the components. And that's a really significant decomposition because uh, you can, for example, architecturally, just from the code contracts, you can make sure that if you hit the brakes, the vehicle will stop okay, in, in a, within a bounded time and, and properties like that. So you do this kind of, you know, without worrying about how the software actually works. That is, you just use the contracts for the step functions. But you also get a number of other things. You get uh, guarantees about message ordering, that messages won't be reordered, you, that messages will be, uh, won't be lost, or there's just a bounded number of consecutive messages that are lost. You get end-to-end -end latency bounds. You get failure warnings. You can monitor the assumptions that the architecture makes and tell uh, the system when these uh, assumptions are being violated. For example, if a communication channel is not delivering the expected bounded latency, you can detect it and actually uh, uh, trigger a recovery action. You can ensure that uh, the, there's an absence of denial of service. You can make sure that this partitioning, that they, the nothing that isn't in the, the model of computation is actually in the system. You can actually ensure the complete absence of these side channels and things like that. So this is hugely important in a project. You know, I was resisting the idea of having such an architecture definition language, and the person funding it, Kathleen Fisher, said, you know, please do this. And it was like night and day once we brought in this thing. Before this, we could not integrate anything and have it working. After this, everyone knew their role. They knew what they had to do. And if we just put everything in and pushed a button, the Radler build created a build that just worked. I mean, this is you know, a, a dramatic difference that having something like this makes. And every design should have you know, a model of computation, perhaps even several models of computation and interaction. Code generation plays a really important role in this because, again, it's, it's a, uh, if, if you're trying to verify individual lines of code, low-level code, that's a very error-prone, inefficient thing for a skeptic to work with. Whereas if you have a code generator, you can certify it once for all. And, and then you, know, you can generate code from something that's much easier to um, uh, uh, verify the correctness for. So you can, you can get abstract descriptions. And uh, you know, I show you a simple example here of uh, a PVS theory. And uh, you know, this is just a higher order summation. You can prove theorems about this. Whoops. Uh, but you can also you know, write uh, uh, you know, functions. Uh, this is the HMAC function from Wikipedia. So you can write this in PVS and generate C code from, from this. Uh, so this this looks exactly like the uh, Wikipedia uh, pseudocode. The, the, I mean, it's, it's actually line for line the same, with just a little more uh, detail in it about specific uh, lengths of strings and so on. So all of this, I mean, if, if you get this, then you can be sure that there's not going to be any runtime error in the generated code. So that's the uh, advantage you get. And, and it's uh, bit accurate and so on. Another important point is actually ontic type analysis. Often in software, you know, we tend to think in terms of these things are data types like integers or you know, 32 bit integers, 64 bit integers. But we don't make the distinction as to what this integer is. Is it a user ID? Is it an IP address? Is it the you know, horizontal acceleration of the plane versus the vertical acceleration of the plane? So with ontic types, you can actually bring in these distinctions. You can say, you know, this is a key. It's a private key, or a public key, or a session key. This is a session. This is the key for that session. This is this person's public key. 
and uh, you know, so you can make sure that when you're sending something on a public channel, it's encrypted. When you're sending it to someone, it's encrypted in their public key. All of these things, you know, are mistakes that happen all the time. In fact, many of those errors, I celebrity bugs. Many of them are actually due to ontic type errors, and uh, so that's something that you can you can actually fix. So in this case, you know, taint analysis is an example of an ontic type. So you don't want tainted input to reach a sensitive operation like an SQL query. And uh, a lot of things happen because of these kind of um, SQL uh, format vulnerable vulnerabilities. So you can actually you know, do an ONTIC type check to make sure that if all of the input that goes into uh, forming an SQL query has gone through a sanitizer to make sure that there's a taint analysis. Because you could do something better than that, which is use prepared statements. That's even a more efficient thing to do. But again, all of these come at a cost. I mean, prepared statements would also be uh, you know limiting in some ways and so on. But the, you, know, you can see the need for uh, you know getting to an efficient argument in your design when you do these things. Um, this is uh, you know you can you can debloat your application because when you build on this magnificent software stack, you don't know how much of the stack you're going to use. But once you've done your finished your application. You can say, okay, I'm only using like 5% of the stack. You can, and the other stuff, if you include these libraries, they're sources of vulnerabilities. That means any kind of illegal behavior can now call all kinds of dangerous functions. So if you prune away that functionality while preserving all legal behaviors, you, you, you've got a better defense mechanism. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, by the way, everything I'm mentioning is kind of available on GitHub. So if you want to go look it up, it's, it's, uh, it's there. Um, so Occam is a really nice uh, system. It has many other advantages. The ability to specialize the code gives you whole program bit code. So you know your static analyzer doesn't have to stop the libraries. It can actually analyze everything that is going to be touched. And that's, that's a nice advantage for static analysis. So there's a, a side project from this, which is this whole program LLVM that you can extract from this as well. Then this is the stuff that overlaps with uh, Yanis's talk. So uh, this is the evidential tool bus. And uh, the key idea is here in the evidential tool bus is that you're, you're going to build something that's uh, evidence curating workflow that as the artifacts are being developed or evolving, you can maintain an assurance argument and sync with that so that you can keep all of the evidence, all of the files. So if you ran test cases, you can keep the file for the test cases. You can say which version of the program you analyzed, what was the test result. You can uh, run the static analysis. So you can get the results. You can feed those into other tools. And all of these things are you know, maintained in this. So you can think of the evidential tool bus as a distributed system with these servers and clients actually sitting on these servers. Each server can provide some services. Maybe this can do testing, that can do the static analysis. This might be a build system, and so on. So you can have different services being provided. And all of this is integrated with data log as a meta language. Okay. So the idea then in, in, is that in data log, you have two kinds of predicates. You have predicates that are pure data log predicates. They've been defined in data log. And then you have what I call uninterpreted predicates. These are external services that are invoked. And for an external service, you can go off and find an appropriate server that's willing to provide that service. Then there's like a file system interface that says, OK, in order to do this service, please give me these files. And then you know, the, the uh, service is uh, executed for those files. And new files are generated. And they're given back to the requesting uh, source. And so you build up a, a, a data log derivation with the uh, annotated with the artifacts. And if something changes in, in this, for example, you, maybe you, uh, you know, modify a line of code, then the static analysis can be rerun just for that, and the whole uh, evidence chain can be reconstructed. And so you use uh, data log uh, inference as uh, kind of a proof. You use git for file identity. That's you're not, the claims you're making in data log are not about the file names. They're about the file contents. So if the file contents change, the claims are invalidated. And finally, you use something called cyber logic, a logic of uh, attestation. So that when you send someone something, you can say, it is the file that has gone through static analysis. Okay, that's uh, signed. And uh, so the, the other side can check this before using it. And there's a lot more to cyber logic than that, but it's a logic of attestations. And uh, an another thing I should mention, I mean, the, the 
paper actually gives you the um, uh, description of this data log with this external. The external oracles could be databases too. And you can actually have a fractal structure to it where the, some of the services you're calling are themselves invoked on a, on a ETB network somewhere else so that they themselves might translate into data log queries somewhere else and so on. So you can do that too. But that, that's the thing. And, and so there's a, both a, a kind of uh, hub brand semantics for this. This was actually difficult to work out what a hub brand semantics for these external oracles would look like. And uh, there's also an operational semantics. And there's, uh, so it's doing uh, table data log evaluation on this. And um, it's also doing this in a way that is online. That is, you're not uh, evaluating one query at a time. So queries are just you know, appearing on, you know, in an online way and the processing goes on and some of the queries may share sub-queries and those are actually shared in the execution and so on because this could happen in an engineering environment and uh, so uh, all of this is actually worked out the operational semantics for this is worked out and when you do it this way where you know you can't stop the world and detect whether you've completed the evaluation of query you have to do it as part of this online computation so there's a, a kind of online cycle detection algorithm an incremental cycle detection algorithm uh, that is uh, implemented as part of this so all of this is you know and so we have a etb version on github that was done on python 2.7 but I should point out that the, it, it is kind of, even though the theory is pristine and correct, the implementation, the guy did it and left, uh, it still has some bugs, in, but we're fixing it and we're updating it to Python 3, but we're building another version which is in Java. So we're building ETB in Java. So it has a bunch of different layers, uh, but I won't go through this. So I'll get to the conclusions now in the next two slides. When I started off as a computer scientist, uh, no matter how badly I did my work, I really could not inflict much harm on the world okay, in, in anything that I was doing because software was not of great consequence in those days. I mean, very few people were working on things that actually could affect. But now, you know, a, a lowly programmer in Facebook can cause societal collapse and has caused societal collapse. So, you know, this is a very dangerous environment and in particular your bank accounts your grades your medical records a lot of these things are now you know controlled by software we have always been operating with code as representing design and it's not a very good representation of design in fact there's not even the, the you know there are many properties that don't even show up at the code level that you know you, you can't really reason about you know one of the ontic types for instance is freshness you know, when you're encrypting something, you've got to get a nonce and put it into the thing. What is freshness? You know, is three fresh? Okay. Yeah. You, know, you know, freshness is a property that actually is of, of the computation. So there are many things like this that you can capture in, in ontic types. So the, in computer science, there are extensional properties, properties that are observable on the input-output, and there are intentional properties, properties that are about resource consumption, security, and so on. And there are hyper-properties, which are properties not of individual computations, but of multiple, uh, of uh, basically closure conditions and things like that. So these are things that, you know, you, you, you need to, uh, uh, you know, establish on, on the code. Um, so, so code itself is a, is, a, is a very poor representation. You need to really establish many of these properties either at the requirements level, the architectural level, in order to have an efficient argument. So you can't just say, I got all this code, I'm bringing in libraries, I'm doing this. That's unlikely to work. So in the end, you know, these are things that I've actually made these points. We need to take information seriously and annotate it with ontic types because that represents the intended use of the thing. It tells you which operations are bad. You know, you shouldn't be sending unencrypted data. You shouldn't be putting the key into some email and sending it and things like that. So that, this is what tells you that. Take requirements seriously because you save a lot of money and uh, headaches when you find flaws at the requirements level. Take architecture seriously because this is the glue for actually decomposing an argument. This, your argument hangs on, its, on the architecture and you get a much better uh, argument when, when you actually hang it on a well, well specified, uh, semantically well formed architecture. Take assurance seriously because what you're selling is not the software. You're selling why the software works. So that's the, that should be the end product. You, know, you want to convince somebody that they can use your software without them having to use it and then find out that it does or doesn't work. 
take uh, inline and independent runtime monitoring seriously because all software depends on models and assumptions. You want to make sure that things are conforming to those models and assumptions. So make sure that you, you have runtime monitoring. So root out the sins of our ancestors, remove the original sins, build these workflows so that we can maintain evidence as, uh, in a formally as part of the design process, and finally integrate attestation so that we have, you know, once we've done all this work, we can actually stamp it as, you know, good software and uh, continue with it, and, and continue working with it. Okay, so, you know, right now, Software does mediate our perception of reality. Lots of things we believe because software told us so. So, you know, it is really mediating our perception of truth. And anything that you see in terms of failures and so on, we cannot trust in software. Okay, that means we, we don't, we're not convinced about something. We're not, you know, that looks like a deep fake, for instance. Okay, so this, you know, means that good stuff now is no longer trusted. Okay. So, uh, uh, the, the way we're doing things right now is just making it easier and easier for the attackers, unfortunately. But we do have the tools, we do have the technology to build things right. Okay. So we, we can actually maintain, you know, we can do software development uh, workflows that maintain assurance. We have the tools and uh, models to build efficient arguments. We can actually certify these things with, uh, uh, you know, certificates and audit logs and so on and we can create composable assurance cases that uh, give you this thing. And in the end, what you want is not a software bill of materials as such, that's a meaningless phrase, but you want a software proof of virtues. That is the end result. That, that's the thing that we you know, get from others, prepare our own software proof of virtues, give to someone else. And that's the reason why we can build a framework in which software is the most trusted component. The physical, the wheels may come off, but the software continues to work. Okay. Thank you. So, do you want to ask uh, online first? Yeah. Any questions online? Oh, um, yeah, there, there are standards. Unfortunately, uh, they're kind of performative standards. So you, you kind of pretend to sprinkle pixie dust here and pixie dust there. And so that's why the point here is to emphasize this, this thing, intent, correctness, and acuity. So regardless of the standards, are you building the right system? Are you building it right? And are you making sure there's nothing else in it, that anything else in it is not going to affect the first two things. And uh, so, uh, you know, that uh, uh, means that you're really paying attention to the semantics of the things. You're not pretending to do something just to conform to the standards. I mean, the, the, the standards are useful. They, they uh, uh, give you certain disciplines and all that. I uh, showed you one of the things here briefly. I didn't go over it. but. Uh, Oops, uh, this is the DO-178C, the traceability diagram. So th this is, uh, I mean, putting things into this particular template makes it easier for the evaluator because the evaluator is used to seeing things like this. And uh, so this is actually uh, quite a nice standard. But within this, make sure that you're doing those, you know, intent correctness and acuity things. So don't just go by the uh, letter of the standard, you know, Go by the spirit of it. Yeah. Good question, by the way. Yes. Yeah, thanks. I can, on my very past, I'm a data logger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and data log is, is, uh, is, a, is a great conceptual tool. But it's, I haven't seen it being used widely for some time. Data. Yeah. Can you describe what made you choose data logging and how it matches with Thanks, yeah. Uh, appreciate you asking that question. So one of the things that uh, made data log attractive to us was a property that I call semantic neutrality. That the objects that are the arguments to a data log uh, predicate 
are just whatever they are. You know, they're, they're files, they're kind of lists of things, they may be numbers and so on. And all the semantics actually comes from the services that you invoke. And uh, that we needed that separation. We wanted a, a workflow thing that was semantically neutral. It didn't make any judgments on things. The predicates were just predicates. The they, they, uh, meaning entirely came from the, uh, so like a static anal uh, analysis uh, tool. It tells you what, what the meaning is. And this made it very attractive. By the way, when you add this kind of external oracle, you, you do make the data log Turing complete because you can actually do unification now. Uh, you know, the, you can bring that in. But um, just because you can do that doesn't mean people are doing it. That is, you know, the m people make more limited uses of this. The other advantage of data log is it's declarative. The other advantage is you can d do this distributed evaluation of it. You can do the kind of interleaved execution of this. Um, and in the end, the, you, you get this derivation, the, the proof derivation. And that was important to us. It was important for us to have this kind of the horn clauses uh, unfolded as a, into a derivation tree. So all of these properties actually made data log very attractive to us. Absolutely, yeah. We, we make use of the recursive aspects. In fact, one of the things that the uh, oracles can themselves do is that they can dynamically generate uh, data log horn clauses. So that part of what, what an oracle can, can do, uh, and th these are things that you may not be able to express in, in the uh, source data log because uh, you, you need to uh, have a, a kind of dynamically uh, sized data log program. Uh, you need to take certain queries and actually in inline them into uh, you know and and so those are the kinds of things you can so it actually when it does that it it gives you back uh, a a data log uh, clause that that it actually implemented and that you can then put back into the der derivation tree as well please Yeah, so we, we uh, are doing that in a project uh, as we speak. We did it in a limited way. So for example, this particular DO-170HC, this actually, you can see the data log in that. Okay. <laughs> you can see the breakdown of this. Uh, you know, you want the um, uh, system requirements. That is, your plane has some requirements, but some of those are allocated to software. And you take those and you say, OK, you know, that those follow from the uh, high level requirements of the software and uh, you know th then you decompose that into you know has have the requirements been validated have uh, uh, you know is does the architecture deliver the requirements and so on so so this is something and in in this the way you do it is actually in two phases you have a, a one data log phase in which you generate the evidence and you have another data log phase in which you certify the evidence and that's kind of what we're doing in, in a current project, um, a DARPA project called Arcos, which is trying to automate uh, the certification of software. Because certification is the biggest cost in software. The uh, military, uh, I mean, more than half the cost of the software itself is, is certification. So that's the biggest cost. And, and if you can reduce that, You've, you've really made things a lot more efficient. The, the, in many of these cases, you can't get new software into the system because it's so expensive to certify. And this is useful. That's, uh, I'm not sure if I didn't express my, my question correctly, but I think... Oh, are we using it for doing our own tools? Yes, yes. Uh, yes yeah, to that's... Verify, yeah, assert, yeah. Own tools, yeah. Using your tools to assert themselves. Yeah. So that's a great question also. The, the, uh, uh, not in a systematic way, but we do it in, in kind of, uh, in, in little ways. Uh, let me give you an example. So um, quite often what you want is, is to use tools that are untrusted, but they generate certificates that you can then check. So a, a, a static analyzer, you don't have to have a static analyzer that is perfect because it can generate uh, annotations that you can easily check 
independently and for those tools you can use this actually I have a approach to that that uh, I, I call it the kernel of truth because in, in the end there's a kernel that you trust and all of the evidence that you generate you know through several levels of indirection come down to uh, you only need to trust the kernel that's it so so that's the approach yeah so th this is uh, something uh, again that that is a uh, important part of the approach because the, there are things that we can verify that are slow moving targets and then there are these fast moving targets where you just want to verify the certificate rather than the analyzer itself yeah. Please ask, yeah. Um, so there's a very high level question. So you started off uh, by talking, uh, showing this big stack of uh, you know, hardware or the making applications. Um, and you were talking about composition. So my question is, do you need um, the, the interface between these very different layers, like the hardware layers and the software layers, be standardized so that you know, the assumptions one layer makes about the other layer are you know, indeed guaranteed by the Layers. So, uh, so that's one question. Like, um, you know, what kind of uh, language or um, idealization or abstraction can you have that um, can work at the interface of these uh, layers? And the kind of a related question is that uh, some of these tools that we we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, do you not see them as being just bigger band-aids because they're also not doing the whole stack all the way from the hardware. So they're also, you know, uh, patching a few things that you can handle at the moment. So just wondered your comments on that. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me address the first question first. The uh, interfaces. In some cases, you know, you do have uh, existing standardized uh, things like instruction sets and so on. But in other cases, you do need to uh, specify, for instance, what the uh, Formats of the artifacts are, and so for that, uh, you, uh, so you, you so do. Right, this instruction set, right? These assumptions you are making about side channels not being there. Yeah. And the lower level is supposed to try and meet that again. But there is a sense of formalization of an ideal you know, model without the side channels or you know, side channels. There is no effort from the say the hardware design to. Uh, oh. It's just, it's in an ad hoc manner, right? Yeah, and yeah. That's a, that's a valid point. Yeah, we, uh, we are definitely missing some of the uh, uh, ways in which we can export these abstractions to to higher levels, and and I think that's another thing activity that would be really interesting to have, which is that uh, the. Um, Vendors of these things are able to uh, conform to a particular uh, abstraction, and, and you know they're able to give you uh, guarantees on on the the products that they supply with respect to this. And and uh, you know so in some cases that does involve standardization within industry. So the standardization of I mean going back to uh, instruction sets like uh, RISC V and ARM, you know that that's helpful because y you you do. Uh, have at least a, a shared way of interpreting what the instructions do, uh, but there are other things which uh, you know involve interchange of uh, data that also need to be standardized. So th these are things where uh, a lot can go wrong if if uh, uh, the the way in which some some piece of data is actually written uh, and uh, read can be uh, incompatible, and so a lot can go wrong with those interfaces as well. So you need to. Uh, you know, this is something that doesn't come cheap. It's an expensive effort to uh, uh, create the uh, uh, semantic abstractions in, in, and um, standardize them in, in a way that's practically usable. Right now, the, the remind me the second question was uh, on the, the whether whether we're doing band aids. Whether we're doing band-aids with, uh, with with this? No, not really. No, these are not band-aids. So when you when you actually do any kind of formal analysis, I'll see, I'll see lunch, yeah. when you when you do any kind of formal uh, analysis, uh, you you uh, end up scrutinizing the design so carefully that you uh, you uh, kind of uh, unconsciously end up trying to uh, create efficient designs so that 
you know, you, you can make uh, more and more elegant arguments about them. So, the, you, you, so my concern there is that you know, uh, there are a lot of things like say side channel attacks on the hybrid. Even with your formal model, you are blind, you'll be blind to that unless it is uh, you know, formal. So you know, you have to have the uh, yeah, this is the thing I was telling about. The the yes, advantage of doing this is that you you kind of know where the skeletons are. Whereas previously the skeletons could have been anywhere. So, uh, so your um, like uh, architectures they can handle um, like all layers, or is it like you know, do you need is it specific software? No, it, it's uh, 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 it, it decomposes the problem into things that are specific to software, things that are platform assumptions. And the advantage of doing this is now that, you know, if you, if you uh, perhaps change platforms or something changes in the platform, it's a local check to ensure that the platform assumptions still hold. Okay. So it, it's the kind of explicitness of this that uh, helps you. It's, you know, if you, if you keep things implicit, if, if you don't separate concerns, then the, the problem becomes exponentially harder. Yeah, it, 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 it does. I mean, because uh, I haven't shown these things, but you, you can uh, actually uh, identify the threat models, right? You can say, you know, uh, the, these assumptions could be attacked in these following ways. And then you, you would have to show in your assurance case that, uh, you know, e each of those uh, threat, uh, threats is actually uh, being mitigated. Yeah, so, so it does show up, uh, and, and uh, there, there are interesting interactions also that in some cases uh, safety and security are uh, uh, synergistic because after all if someone attacks the security of the system they can crash the system as well. In some cases they actually uh, you know, uh, counter one another in that uh, you know, the, there's a trade-off. You know, achieving some level of security means giving up certain functionality and uh, so on. So that, that can can also be uh, something that you have to resolve in a design, but the f the fact that you're doing it explicitly is is the important point, that you're not uh, doing this and and uh, not uh, communicating the fact that you know security was compromised for the sake of functionality. Yeah, please ask. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I think yeah. Call and variable stack, yeah. So, uh, I don't know whether the problem is really conflation of the two things or the problem is with the freedom to write more than the space that has been allowed. I mean, one of the choices we made was that it's expensive. It, it turns out it's actually not that expensive. When, when people have measured it, it's, it's like a few percent points to do bounce checking. But you know, we, we decided that you know these programs had the freedom to not do bounce checking, and that this would uh, be something that would go. Uh, the thing is that you need to build efficient mechanisms. You know, bounce checking is not an efficient mechanism. So that means if, if there's one gap in your bounce checking 
people drive a truck through it. Whereas if you separate out these stacks, in fact, you, you don't even have stack allocation so that you can't even know where some piece of data is in a predictable way. You have an efficient argument. And that's that's really the main uh, argument for it. Yeah, but whose problem is it? And uh, so, it, I mean, take for example speculative execution. You know, if instead of kind of uh, crossing stack boundaries, the, there was a defense mechanism that actually corrupted your own cash values, then, you know, I think that's a better solution. Because, you know, then you'll take the responsibility for getting it right. And, and you, you won't have the side channel attack. Okay, so, so that's the kind of thing. I don't, I don't have a problem with, you know, like this, you know, see undefined behavior. Once you do that, I, know, I can do anything. That's okay with me. You know, that, that's fine in terms of an efficient argument. It's, it's these kinds of things where, you know, it, it's really hard for me to make sure that you've really dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. I don't want that. I want some big box that you draw that says, you know, this is the reason it, it works. Yeah. In, yeah, it's a good thing to have it outside of the language because you want to connect it to the domain ontology of the application. And, and that's important because you, you, you want to be able to know that, you know, this is the, the left tire RPM versus the right tire RPM. And uh, so it, it is, and, and that's a good thing because now you can layer this. Uh, you know, people are designing languages like uh, Facebook's Move language, which takes, you know, the idea of currency and says, okay, currency can only be moved. Uh, you can't copy it, for instance. You know, you could have taken any language and actually imposed an ontic type of currency on it and said, and created this particular uh, constraint on it. And so that's a nice thing about ontic type systems is that on the one hand, because it's connected to the domain ontology, you want it to be a separate thing. But now you can put it, layer it on top of any language so that it has the right semantics. Yeah, University of Washington, um, uh, Mike Ernst has this checker framework for Java. Okay, so yeah, there are no further questions online. Uh, let's thank, thank Shankar. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Supratik for 